So welcome to the Christchurch Carol Service 2020. You'll have seen from the opening screen that our theme this evening is comfort and joy. And so we do hope and pray that you will find a little bit of comfort and joy in our service. I'm sure you'll recognise the phrase from the well-known carol, God rest you merry gentlemen. A little bit of trivia that actually dates from the, at least the 16th century and is mentioned in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. So obviously, that's going to be one of the carols that we're singing, along with a few other well-known ones. All the words will be on the screen, so please join in and sing your hearts out. Between the carols, we'll be bringing you a report from the Palestine Broadcasting Company, which may seem more than a little bit familiar. We'll also hear the message that an angel brought to some shepherds one night a long, long time ago, read from the Bible. And then Alan will be briefly sharing some thoughts about it. We'll also hear some words from a new mum whose baby was born just four months ago. In the reading, we'll hear that the angel said, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. So put fear aside, sing as loud as you like, and if you like me, as out of tune as you like, and settle down to hear some good news.
Welcome to the news from the PBC, the Palestine Broadcasting Corporation, bringing you all the stories that matter from across Roman-occupied Palestine and the wider empire. The headlines tonight. Yet more delays as the high-speed aqueduct project goes even further over budget. New traffic calming measures in central Jerusalem. Camel drivers say it's like trying to get through the eye of a needle. And patriots or fanatics? What's the truth behind the group known as the Zealots? But first, our main story, travel chaos, as families register for the emperor's new census. The decree of Caesar Augustus, that the head of each household in the empire must register in the town of his birth, has led to huge disruption as families journey back to their hometowns in order to comply with the new law. In some places, travelling families are being met with outright hostility. Our Judea correspondent, Jonathan Newshound, reports. I'm in the little town of Bethlehem, which lies some six miles south of the Judean capital, Jerusalem. Here, tensions have been running high since a recent influx of families from other parts of Palestine arriving to register for the census. Some residents are furious at the strain being put on local resources. I think it's disgusting what the politicians are putting ordinary working families through with this census. Because it's all right if you're the emperor or King Herod, you can just sit in your palace all day. You don't have to deal with all these travellers turning up, needing places to stay, and buying up all the food in the shops. I've just been down the high street. You can't get a bag of olives for love, no money. And my brother, he runs an inn on the other side of town. He's got no room. No room at the inn. He's having to put people in the stable. That's not right treating people like animals, and I'm not being funny, but when you've got them turning up from all over, you know, Galilee, Samaria, wherever, you don't know what sort of diseases they're bringing with them, do you? Well, you don't. They should stop the count now. Right now, stop the count. Stop the count. That's the slogan being chanted, not just in Bethlehem, but across the whole of Judea. So great is popular discontent with the census that King Herod, the Roman appointed governor of Judea, has suggested that his region may make its own local rules concerning the census, quite apart from those applying to the rest of the Roman Empire. Judea has a proud tradition of independence and autonomy. We simply don't need a foreign power telling us how to count our own people. And in fact, we have already developed our own world-beating counting process. An oven-ready census of which we can be justifiably proud. So my message to the people of Judea is threefold. Stop the count. Stay at home. Save yourselves the bother. Unsurprisingly, the Emperor Augustus has responded to King Herod's statement in a typically robust manner. Emperor Augustus, King Herod has said that he will not implement your census regulations and is planning for Judea to exit the whole process. What is your view of what some people are calling Jexit? First of all, let me say that the census I have ordered will help to make Rome great again. And lots of people, smart people, important people, are saying that this is a really, really great census. In fact, the greatest census in history. And people who criticize my census, who are they? King Herod? He isn't even a real king. He's a fake king. He calls himself Herod the Great. I call him Herod the Loser. And if he doesn't get back into line, he will be faced with fire and fury like the world has never seen. And if he doesn't like being part of the Roman Empire, he can just go home to wherever he came from. Uh, isn't he already at home? Next question. So, disturbing signs of conflict between regional and central government, with the Emperor clearly indicating that he is prepared to use overwhelming force to impose his policy 
in the face of local opposition. Jonathan, how has that statement been received on the streets of Bethlehem? Well, with a mixture of defiance and fear, there are those who support independence from Rome and who see the census crisis as a trigger for a wider popular rebellion, while others, quite understandably, are very anxious at any talk of defying the most powerful military machine on earth. But just while we've been on air, attention has been diverted somewhat from the political conflict by reports of a quite extraordinary event said to have taken place in fields outside Bethlehem. Eyewitnesses report the appearance of an angel to a group of shepherds who said, and I quote, do not be afraid. I bring good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. The same witnesses also describe a huge heavenly choir singing glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favour rests. Well, whatever the truth of these reports, they have certainly brought a welcome sense of hope and excitement to this town at a time of deep division and anger. This is Jonathan Newshound in Bethlehem, where it has been anything but a silent night. Thank you, Jonathan. We should say that the shepherds were invited onto the programme to comment, but they declined, saying that they were too busy searching for a baby who, according to the angel, was the Messiah and would be found in a manger in Bethlehem. But before we end this bulletin, we have just enough time to return to the Emperor's News Conference where he was asked to comment on the news of angels and the arrival of a new leader in Bethlehem. Fake news. It's fake news. It'll go away like a miracle. That's all from us. Good night.
The reading is Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken for the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy among all the people. Today, in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Son of God. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen, which were just as they had been told.
Okay, hi. Well, the carol that we've just sung talks about tidings of comfort and joy. Comfort and joy. Two qualities that I think have been in short supply, actually, in 2020. What a year it's been. This time last year, no one would have predicted the impact this terrible virus would have on lives around the world. Who would have thought we'd be restricted to our own homes, not allowed to meet with friends for a meal out, and have to wear face masks to go shopping, amongst many other things. And for all of us, in many different ways, it's been a difficult year. Loss, grief, pain, and stress everywhere. Loss of loved ones, loss of freedom, health, job, holidays, security, and still we don't know what the future holds. Will it ever end? And for me, will I be able to hug my children and grandchildren again? We're recording this in November, in the middle of England's second lockdown, so we're still not sure what Christmas will look like, but it won't be what we normally would expect. So how can the story of that first Christmas, of a baby born into a poor family, in obscurity, in strange circumstances, visited by smelly shepherds and later by rich, wise men, have anything to say to us in 2020? Well, I and millions of others believe that this baby is the one who can offer us comfort and joy. What image or what images come to your mind when you think of the word comfort? This year has seen us all living so far out of our comfort zone that we no longer know what normal looks like. But comfort doesn't have to depend on external circumstances. Comfort, I believe, can come from that inner assurance that whatever life holds, however bleak and sad, we have the promise of God with us. Emmanuel, which means God with us, is one of the names you've used of Jesus, especially at Christmas. It's not a promise that everything's going to be okay, that nothing bad will happen to us or to those that we love. It's not like one of those big comfort blankets that we can wrap around ourselves so we don't have to deal with the real issues of life. No, I think it's the inner peace from, that comes from knowing, that comes from the knowledge, as the old hymn puts it, it's well with my soul. And we can each receive God's promise of his presence and his comfort, and I pray that that will be our experience this Christmas. Listen to this encouragement and challenge from the New Testament. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. God is the source of all comfort. And as we receive God's comfort, we can then seek to reach out to others to bring comfort to them. And this can be in small ways. For example, three weeks ago, my wife, Kathy had a hip replacement, an operation she should have had much earlier in the year. She's recovering well. But like everything else this year, COVID ensured that this was no ordinary procedure. We both had to isolate from two weeks before the operation. But we experienced comfort in so many ways. Neighbors brought us the paper each day. Our daughter shopped for us, learning what a courgette and broccoli look like. Friends brought food, and others dropped by for a doorstep chat, or rang, or sent cards. Many people prayed. We felt loved and comforted. Along with comfort, the hymn talks about joy. There was a lot of joy around at that first Christmas. We had that read to us. The shepherds felt this on seeing the baby in the manger. And hopefully we can all picture examples of joy from our own life. The look on a child's face on Christmas morning when they open that present that they've been longing for. A reunion with friends and family. A celebration. A great sunset. A lovely piece of music. It can be many things. But hopefully we all know that emotion of great pleasure caused by something that means so much to us personally. And often that feeling is dependent on something wonderful or longed for happening. But joy is also a state of mind, a settled state of contentment that can be independent of our circumstances. And I've got to be honest with you, this year 
has not been one marked by a lot of joy for me, and I guess for many of us. It's certainly not the first emotion that I think I've been experiencing through this COVID crisis. I've struggled to know it in my life, but I believe that joy is a choice. Joy is mentioned 75 times in the Bible as a gift from God and as a fruit of his spirit living in us. Put simply, it's choosing to respond to external circumstances with inner contentment and satisfaction, believing that although we don't know, often know what's going on, God does. And despite circumstances, there is purpose and hope. He's in control, and he loves and cares for me and for you. So back to our story. Why is the Christmas story one of good news, of comfort and joy? Well, the carol tells us. It says, Remember Christ our Saviour was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. You see, this baby didn't just grow up to live an amazing life and give wise teaching on how to live, but he claimed to be the Son of God, coming to the world to save people from their sins. But let's be honest, many of us don't like to think that we need saving. But this pandemic has shown me how vulnerable we human beings are, and that some things are just out of our control. Yet still we look no further than ourselves, or to scientists, or to politicians, to solve our problems. Why do we not consider also turning to God? Maybe he has some wisdom to share and lessons for us to learn. I know in my heart I'm not the person I want to be, but I'm so thankful that Jesus offers us forgiveness, a new beginning, and a chance to turn our lives around and live in the way that he intended, to know comfort and joy no matter what the circumstances. And maybe this Christmas is a time for you to seriously consider the offer of salvation that Jesus brings. His gift to you, summarised in the most famous verse in the Bible from John chapter 3. Let me read it to you. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its saviour. So I'm going to finish by saying a simple prayer. You may want to echo this prayer in your heart. Father God, thank you that Jesus came into the world to be our saviour, to offer us comfort and joy. I am sorry this hasn't meant much to me over the years, but today I want to know you as my saviour. I ask that you would forgive me for living life my own way, and I pray that I would know you as Emmanuel, God with me this Christmas and throughout the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, Amen. Can I suggest if you prayed this prayer or something like it, you tell someone as soon as possible, or if that doesn't work for you, contact us, contact us on our church website. So may I wish you a Christmas time in which you experience God's comfort and God's joy. Thank you.
so this time last year I was already thinking ahead to this Christmas and trying to imagine what life would be like with a baby and while I got lots of the things I imagined I'd get like sleepless nights and vomit kind of covered clothes I didn't quite imagine that things would be exactly like this I was sent to work from home about 10 days before lockdown began and I was quite worried at the time about feeling alone and I felt quite vulnerable um, particularly as my husband was increasing the amount of hours that he was working. I'd had quite a difficult pregnancy from the beginning with um, a fair amount of sickness and people kept telling me that that would get better but actually it just didn't and um, then at about 32 weeks of pregnancy it actually just got worse and for those next three weeks I really struggled and found it really hard and it kind of all, it all came to a head really um, one Friday afternoon and I was sat on the bathroom floor phoning my husband and asking him to come home because I couldn't cope anymore and um, at the same time I sent a text to uh, my home group and asked them if they would pray for me but not really expecting anything because they'd prayed for me a few times and um, nothing had really changed and that text uh, then got sent to the wider church whatsapp group um, and within a few days not only had things got better they the sickness had completely gone and it meant I was actually really able to enjoy the last few weeks of pregnancy and I really saw that as a um, amazing answer to prayer for me um, giving birth in this time has been really weird I was able to have my husband there with me for the birth but um, then as soon as we were moved to the postnatal ward uh, he had to go home and we weren't allowed any visitors until we could go home which was really difficult because I'd had some problems and um, it was quite a stressful time. Um, but actually throughout this whole experience that feeling of being alone hasn't ever really materialised so we've had loads of support lots of texts and letters and phone calls that have always come at the right time and even on the days where I have just been on my own at home without really hearing from anyone I've never really felt that um, being alone I've always felt that God was with me and we chose to call um, our little boy Felix because it means happiness. But actually, I think um, having looked into it a little bit more in the early church, it was used quite commonly as a name to mean happiness in finding God. And I think for us, um, that's absolutely what he's done. He's helped us to find God even more just by the absolute joy that he's brought into our lives. And um, just getting to know him with his lovely, happy demeanour has just been really special this year.
Well, that brings us to the end of our carol service. I hope you've enjoyed joining in and have found some comfort and joy along the way too. If you'd like to know more about Christchurch, then have a look at our website, christchurchb29.org, and please feel free to get in touch with us through the contact page there. So let's finish with a prayer. Father God, we thank you for Jesus and for the opportunity to celebrate Christmas by singing carols and thinking about your message to us. We know that for most of us and those that we know, our families and our friends, that this will be a very different Christmas with more loneliness and sadness and with more fear and uncertainty about the future than we normally experience. We pray that we would know your comfort and joy this Christmas. Replace our loneliness with a real sense of your love for us and your presence with us and give us hope. And as the shepherds set off to find the baby Jesus, we pray that you would help us to seek you and to find you this Christmas. Amen. I read somewhere that God rest you merry sort of means may God grant you peace and happiness. So I finish with that. May God grant you peace and happiness this Christmas. Happy Christmas.